If you struggle with bloating and associated issues, I am going to share some science today that may be able to help you. I'm also going to blend in my own experience because I dealt with bad bloating for the better part of a decade, but it is finally gone now thanks to the solution I'm about to share with you. And I'm also going to tell you about some pretty crazy new scientific findings on how the gut works and how we can use that to understand why we have bloating. Hey there, I'm Mish, and I am a full-time researcher with my PhD, and by day I conduct and publish studies of my own, whereas by night I share the results of other people's studies here to help you reach your weight loss, fitness, health, and nutrition goals. And today's video is a little different from what I usually do, because instead of just focusing on studies, I am going to lead in with my own experience and then use scientific studies to support my theory for why my solution has worked for me and why I think it could help you too. But even if you don't deal with bloating, I guarantee you will learn something new about the gut today that you might be able to apply to your life in other ways. And for some background, for about nine years until last year when I put this solution into play, I dealt with pretty bad bloating in cycles of usually a few weeks to a couple months at a time. And then I would have a few weeks to a couple months of no bloating and then back to bloating. It was not related to hormones, was very mysterious. I tried to cut out so many different foods in case they were causing it and had no luck. But finally, one day I put the pieces together, actually while reading about the gut and how it works and some of the things I'll be sharing with you today, and testing this theory came out. So whenever I did the solution that I came up with from this theory, I did not have bloating. But of course, as a scientist, I had to do a better test than that and had to actually do test retest on myself. So I would actually do the thing that I thought was causing bloating on some days and then do the solution on other days. And lo and behold, on the day where I did the thing that I thought was causing bloating, I got bloating. Whereas on the days I did the solution, I did not get bloating. <laughs> and for regulars here, you might be thinking, well, what about placebo effects? Because we know how powerful they are. So to control for placebo effects, I did something a little nuts, which was go back into my data that I have been collecting for many years about my stomach issues and what I eat, where I have just been writing down the foods I eat in a day, every day for a very long time, in case someday I could use it to get to the bottom of my bloating issues. Then I also recorded how bad my bloating was every day. So I had all this data for years about what foods I've been eating and also how my stomach was every day. So I actually went back into that data and ran a statistical analysis just like I do in my studies and just like in all the studies I show you here, which feels a little ridiculous to do, but it was really fun. <laughs> it is a fun story now for my science friends. And I found that the thing that I thought has been causing bloating was indeed an extremely strong, statistically significant predictor of my bloating for many, many months before I even thought this might have been causing it, so without any placebo effects in there. So this strongly suggests that the solution I'm about to share with you today is at least the solution that has almost certainly solved my bloating issues, and therefore I feel like there is a good chance that at least some of you could benefit from this too, especially because it was so ridiculously easy of a solution that I have to share it. But now to walk you through how I actually got to the solution and what it is, I used to think that I had an oat intolerance because I noticed that my bloating was always really bad when I had oats for breakfast. But what I didn't realize until just recently is that when I eat oats for breakfast, I like to add nut butter. So my breakfasts end up being higher fat when I eat oats, just coincidentally, not actually related to the oats. And what I finally realized was that when I have a normal fat or higher fat breakfast and then have a lower fat lunch that always pretty much like 99% of the time produces bloating in the late afternoon and evening. However, when I have a low fat breakfast followed by a moderate or higher fat lunch, I'm fine. And also if I have low fat breakfast, low fat lunch, I'm fine. And if I have moderate fat or high fat breakfast and moderate fat or high fat lunch, I'm also fine. So to sum up, the issue arises when I have a moderate fat or higher fat breakfast followed by a low fat lunch. This is also the case if I have a lower fat dinner, but I just don't do that as often. But when I have tested this like 30 times now, it very consistently causes issues to have lower fat after higher fat. And bear with me because this will extend beyond fat. This is just the example of how it shows up in my own life. So my theory based on science that I am about to share with you is that changing up macronutrient ratios or other aspects of food that I'm about to tell you about between back-to-back -back meals could be causing digestive problems for some people. In particular, switching the fat content of meals or the fiber content of meals, I expect will cause the worst problems. And my theory as to why this happens is because of transit time, because it is known that different types of foods and different macronutrient 
compositions change how long it takes for you to digest food. So how long it takes between your mouth to when you expel it. And in particular, it is well known that fiber increases how quickly things go through your body, whereas fat slows things down. And I think that this phenomenon could lead to bloating because your gut is kind of like a train track and each meal you send through is like a train. So if you first send through a slow train with your higher fat or lower fiber breakfast, and then you follow that up with a very fast train, like a low fat and high fiber lunch, then you get a train crash because the first train is moving slow and the next train just comes and hits it. And I think this kind of train crash could be caused by, for example, having fried food in one meal and then having salad a few hours later, or even something like having a tofu scramble for breakfast followed by a hummus veggie whole grain wrap for lunch because that wrap is gonna travel faster most likely than that tofu scramble and they might collide in your gut. And I think that a bloating issue can arise if your gut bacteria are not prepared to handle that kind of crash because you're not constantly and consistently doing it for a long time in a way that would allow your gut bacteria to handle that. And in particular, the way I think of it is your gut bacteria are still working on the first meal when you send in the second one. And when you send in a second one that has a bunch of undigested stuff going into the partially digested stuff, I imagine that could cause some problems, especially with fermentation in a way that could produce a lot of gas. Another possible reason why having meals that really differ in transit time could potentially cause issues is that your gut bacteria have circadian rhythms. So if they're not set up to expect a meal coming way sooner than usual, that could cause some problems. Or perhaps because it's known that transit times play a big role in gut bacteria clearance rates. So you actually do clear out some of your gut bacteria every time you eat, it comes out when you go to the bathroom. And that's actually how we usually measure gut bacteria. And in fact, it's been shown that transit time is a strong modulator of the relationship between the host and the gut microbiome, the host being you. <laughs> so transit time may be playing a role in how nicely your gut bacteria play with you. And I do wanna note, I am not a digestion or gut expert, but I find it really cool. So I thought I would share these studies with you along with my theory. And I usually keep all my theories just over on my Patreon page, but I thought I would share this one here because it is so general because it doesn't depend on food allergies or person-specific factors too much. And also because it's so easy to implement, I thought I would just try sharing and see what you think. Oh, and for an extra fun fact where an old theory I had has come true because it has been shown by studies, is that eating actually increases gas transit time in your system. So people sometimes think, oh, if I eat something and then have gas immediately afterwards, that thing caused the gas. But that is not the case the vast majority of the time because it's actually just pushing your old gas through from past meals faster. So you're just seeing your old gas come through faster <laughs> because you just ate. So postprandial flatulence is a known phenomenon in the scientific literature. And it was nice to see my other digestion theory come true, which makes me more confident about the theory I am sharing with you today. Also, as far as the dinner issue, the way I see it, an overnight fast might be a way to reset things. So I don't anticipate that having a breakfast that really differs from your dinner in terms of transit time should cause nearly as many issues because you're less likely to get that train crash I talked about because there's so much time in between them. And for the rundown of what I did specifically to solve my bloating, the short version is I add fat to my low fat meals when they come after higher fat meals. And I'll talk about what you can do for yours and how that might differ from my situation. But specifically, I usually have a smoothie for breakfast and it has some hemp seed and sunflower butter, so it is moderate fat. And then for lunch, I often like to have fat-free curries just because they're good. And so now I'll just add some tahini or have some nuts with them or add some avocado. And that has completely solved my bloating, which is kind of ridiculous that after nine years of bloating, it was solved by adding like a tablespoon of fat to lunch. So I had to share because it was so ridiculously easy. If it can help even one of you, then it was worth making this video. And for an extra piece of the puzzle that wasn't very applicable to me, but could be very applicable to you is fiber quantities because I get tons of fiber at every meal, doesn't vary wildly. Just that's how it is with whole foods plant-based diet. But if you have variability in your fiber intake, then you may want to try to mess with that to see if that helps with your bloating. So in particular, if you have a low fiber breakfast and then have a higher fiber lunch after that, I would expect that to cause more problems than the reverse because fiber, as a reminder, makes your meals move through you faster. So you want your early ones to be faster than your later ones, or you want them to all be similar. So I would suggest making your earlier meals higher in fiber and your later meals lower in fiber if you do want to have meals that are lower in fiber at all. And I want to make very clear that if your digestion is fine and you don't have any bloating, there is no reason to do the things I talked about in this video. There is no reason to change your fat or fiber or anything like that. 
if your gut bacteria and your digestion are already happy with what you're doing. There's a good chance you are adapted to whatever you are currently doing. However, I have a feeling that this is strongly dependent on gut microbiome. So for example, in my case, I suspect it may be related to a horrible stomach flu I had right before the bloating started, where it was an incredibly gnarly stomach flu. So I probably really messed up my gut bacteria with that. And that might be why my gut is more sensitive to this specific ordering of meals and transit time. And I think this whole thing is a great example of how digestion issues can be way more complicated than any of us would ever expect. Because for example, I thought for years that I had an oat intolerance because whenever I had oats for breakfast, I pretty much always had bloating later in the day. So I cut out oats and I did indeed have fewer bloating days just because I'd then be eating lower fat breakfast without those oats. And also it's pretty crazy to realize that the reason that I had bloating cycles that would last for a few weeks to a couple months and then have a break for a while is because my husband requests fat-free lunches because I, I bulk cook for us whenever he wants to lose weight because eating low fat foods makes him lose weight really fast. So I would just make these really delicious whole foods plant-based curries that just happened to not have any added fat and I would eat those too because they're good. And why not? And then I would get horrible bloating and I didn't realize that was why. Unfortunately, it doesn't yet seem like any studies have directly looked at what happens to bloating when you change meal order, or change meal composition, but I really hope some come out. But rather, this is my theory based on all this science that I just talked about, as well as my own experience with how effective it has been to change meal order or a slightly change meal composition to completely solve my bloating. And I would love to hear from you. Have you noticed this kind of phenomenon in yourself in terms of changing macronutrient compositions or switching the order of meals? And do you plan to try this? I would love to hear what you think. So let me know in the comments below. And apparently I'm in a focus group mode lately between the last video and this one, because I would love to know your opinion on whether you like these types of theory videos. I usually keep my theories to myself or just over on Patreon because I like to stick to just science here. But also I have a lot of theories and my job is literally, my day job, my career, is to come up with and test theories. And I'm pretty darn good at that in my job. So it would be nice to be able to share that with you all, but only if you're interested. So let me know if you are interested in hearing my theories below. And if you want to support me in making videos, head on over to my GoFundMe for one-time support or my Patreon where you can sign up monthly to get bonus content and extra findings and get to weigh in on what I talk about in videos and have my eternal gratitude. And if you like this video, please like and share it so we can get this information out there in case it can help more people. And if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell below to stay up to date on all this science and these occasional theories. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.